First, our speakers get a quick intro before they dive in. Dr. Tamer Persico is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, and he teaches at the Department for Comparative Religion in Tel Aviv University. His fields of study are contemporary spirituality, Jewish renewal, forms and trends of secularization, religiosity in Israel, and Jewish extremism. He is an activist for freedom of religion in Israel and writes the most popular blog in Hebrew on religion. He has written hundreds of articles on these subjects for the popular media. Next we have Dr. Ramyar Karanjia. He is an MA and PhD in ancient Iranian languages from the University of Mumbai. He is the principal of Dadar Athornan Institute a religious training school in Mumbai. He is a teacher and professor of religion, Iranian history and languages. He has given talks on religion and religious history all over India and the world. He has written and edited several uh, papers and journals and contributed to several journals on Zoroastrian religion, Iranian history, Iranian languages and spirituality. Finally, we have Chintan Girish Modi. He is a writer, researcher and educator. He consults with the UNESCO's Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. He is also the founder of Friendships Across Borders, Aul Dosi Kare. Welcome to all our speakers and over to you, Chintan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for choosing to come to this panel discussion over others. So, uh, uh, I'm really delighted to moderate this conversation. Uh, and I'm uh, particularly thankful to the literature section of the Kalagoda Arts Festival for having us because religion is something that a lot of people are hesitant to engage with, especially um, people who go for literature festivals because, you know, it's dicey and it's sort of linked to violence because that's the kind of discourse that we usually come up with, come against. So I hope today's conversation will also enable us to explore other aspects of religion which have to do with community, which have to do with self-discovery, um, and you'll know as we go on. So, um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Persico first to share initial thoughts on um, the topic for today, which is uh, the, kind, the points of connection or the similarities between Zoroastrianism and Judaism. And one of the main themes that we'll be looking at today is uh, ideas related to conversion in both religions. Okay, thank you, Chintan. Um, I think when we're talking about the similarities between Judaism and Zoroastrianism, and of course I would like to hear your response, uh, Arwad Rania, um, it is important to first differentiate, I would uh, say, different kinds of religion. Um, in that way in which Judaism and Zoroastrianism are religions, different from, say, Christianity or Buddhism or uh, Islam. And there are many differences, but one that is very clear and is touching on our subject is that both Judaism and Zoroastrianism are non-missionary religions, as we are here to talk about. But this is why, this is because they are also ethnic religions. They are religions of a certain, I would say, ethnic group or even people, while if you take the other examples that I just laid out, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, are all universal religions. They are religions that, are, they, that see themselves as applicable or inviting to any person on earth. Now this very differentiation gets accentuated in our modern era. That's because uh, modernity has laid a lot of emphasis on the individual as an individual, on each and every one of us as a, an individual human being, first and foremost a human being, that can later uh, bring upon himself all sorts of different identities, one of them religion. This sort of thinking is very much, uh, I, I would say it caters very much to the universal religions, to Christianity and Buddhism and Islam, for example. Because just like the individual is universal, is universal, everybody, each and every one of us is a human being, 
universally, that human being can take on himself a universal religion. So I may be an Indian or an American or a German, and I'm also Muslim or Christian or Buddhist. But this same logic is problematic for different, for, for the other kind of religions. I would say for Zoroastrianism and Judaism. And of course, again, I'd be happy to hear what you have to say. Because, because in a very deep way, uh, uh, a Jewish person, it, it would be a problem for that person to define himself as first and foremost as, a, a, let's say, as an American or a, a, a German or, or whatever, and which his, which, of which the religion is Jewish. Now, granted, there are many Jews who do exactly that. American Jews see themselves, a majority of them, as Americans and also Jews. But within the very logic of this tradition, of this religious tradition, this is uh, inherently a problem. This is why, coming from Israel, if, if to take that angle, Israel, the Israeli state was founded as a Jewish state. It is a Jewish state, not for the Jewish religion, but for the Jewish people, who are also Jewish by religion, but, but, they, but the the national identity, the ethnic identity, is very strong in that way. Now, coming back to the subject of missionary activity, you can understand why, why Judaism does not engage in much missionary activity, if, or really any at all. You can, you can convert to Judaism. There's a process. It's not, not, not always easy. But nobody asks you to do it. Nobody encourages Gentiles, non-Jews to do it, uh, and, and within certain circles of Judaism, even they would say they don't really want people to convert. So, uh, for, for just for the start, for laying out the groundwork, I would say, I would say that. Edward Karanji, would you like to? Hello. Hello, good evening, one and all. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Now, first, addressing the issue which Chintan pointed out. First of all, there are scores of religion in the world. But Zoroastrianism seems to be closest to two world religions. One is Judaism and second is Hinduism. With Hinduism, because it shared a common ancestry, common mother, right through the ages. And with Judaism, because it is one of the most ancient religions, and as it is well known, Zoroastrian religion is the oldest religion in the world, and Zarathustra is the first prophet in the world. So, it has been a historic fact that Zoroastrian religion has influenced all other world religions, especially the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, throughout history, Zoroastrianism has never been a religion which has advocated conversion. It's a very well-known fact, uh, Dr. Tomer would be aware of it, that when Cyrus the Great, the Persian emperor who established the Achaemenian dynasty, he freed the Jews from captivity from the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. But instead of asking them to convert to one's own religion, he gave them the freedom to follow their very own religion and in fact encourage them to build their houses of worship. So Zoroastrian religion, right through history, if you go to see, has never enjoined conversion. In fact, in any of the Zoroastrian texts, if you go to see, there is no mention about conversion. Neither is there any ritual or ceremony which would say, okay, is a ceremony of conversion. So throughout history, Zoroastrianism is very clear in its position about 
non-conversion. The point that you made just now is that in the present times, in the modern world, how do we relate to this thing when um, we talk about equality and unity, etc. So what I would like to say is that every religion has got lots to offer. One does not need to become a part of that religion or to convert to get the best aspects of the religion. So even a person who is following one's own religion may not agree or uh, accept all its aspect. But at the same time, one can at least try and understand as many aspects as possible. Thank you for that. Now what I'd like you to, what I'd like to invite you both to do is to explore a little bit about why your religions don't allow conversion because we'd like to know that. Uh, they must, I'm sure there are reasons laid out for that. It's not just a rule which is there. Uh, you were telling me before in the conversation that, you know, uh, there are um, people in the Zoroastrian diaspora who don't really um, live maybe within the community of other Zoroastrians who have been eager to, you know, bring other people into Zoroastrianism and how, what the re response to that has been like. The general perception about religion in the Zoroastrian religion is that, um, or in other religions also, that the world functions through a divine order, divine plan. There's a divine plan and a divine purpose. And the birth of an individual in a particular religion is a part of that divine plan and purpose. So when we get birth in a particular religion, that is part of the divine plan of God, and according to the need of the soul, the person has come into that religion. Secondly, Zoroastrian religion accepts, and I'm sure that all great religions do that, that all religions are good and great. All prophets are good and great. And all prophets are messengers of God. And so they themselves have laid down the path towards the divine world, the divine world. So when you make a statement that I don't want my religion and I want to go into the other religion, it is tantamount to saying that there is something lacking in my religion that the other religion fulfills. And let me tell you that it's not just from the point of view of religions, but all great people who are great spiritualists, who are highly spiritual men, may it be Ramakrishna Paramansa, May it be Swami Vivekananda, may it be Dalai Lama or Mahatma Gandhi himself. They never preached conversion. They asked people to assimilate the best aspect of the other religion. Before I invite you to comment on that, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I'm aware that we're a manal. It's just men talking about religion. So you might find that we are not adequately addressing the issues that might come up, you know, because uh, w with respect to gender, one of the one of the issues that people have with organized religion is that um, it actually does not uh, accommodate or does not respond adequately to the rights and experiences of women. So uh, I would invite both of you to address that. And also when there are questions from the audience, please bring that up. But going back to the topic of conversion, what is um, the position within Judaism as re uh, with respect to why not to convert? Okay, if we talk about Judaism today, we have to understand that there are two large and different groups of Jews in the world. Uh, one large group is in the state of Israel, and the other large group is in the United States of America. Now, these groups have, a, have different views about conversion uh, simply because the way they live and the way they interact with society. When you're a Jew in Israel, like myself, the majority of people around you are Jewish. You really don't see any reason even to talk about conversion. It, it doesn't even come up. Simply ev everybody you meet or almost everybody you meet is Jewish and, and, and chances are your, your mate, the, the person that you will marry, will be Jewish simply out of statistical uh, chance. The Jews in the United States of America are in a completely different situation. They are a minority, 
and they are a minority inside a society that is very accepting and very, very likable towards them. So they have every incentive to go out to mix with the general populace. Of course, they don't live in, in, in homogeneous communities. They, they do live uh, within general society. And since that is the case, they will meet people who are not Jewish and sometimes will want to marry them, right? And this is where the issue of conversion comes. A lot of, there is a huge debate within a Jewish American society about conversion, about conversion relating to marriage. If I am Jewish and I want to marry someone who is non-Jewish, there is fear in the Jewish community that if my spouse will not convert, really the Jewish uh, community will, will, will lose my family, will lose myself and my uh, children and, and they, because they will not be Jewish. So there's a lot of debate in, in the American Jewish community about whether and how to uh, persuade or try to induce spouses of Jewish uh, men and women to convert there. On the other hand, as I said before, in, the, in, in, in Israel, there's not much talk of it, and if there is talk of it, there is talk in the negative direction that it's not needed, conversion is, is not something that we want, and, and, and uh, we'd rather be without it. And this is again because in the state of Israel, the ethnic character of Judaism is very much accentuated. It's a Jewish society, it's a Jewish ethnic society, not a, a national and religious society. So it's a different situation. And this probably sounds frivolous, but when you were talking about marriage, I was thinking of Sex and the City. There's this um, episode where uh, Charlotte wants to marry this guy who is Jewish, and you know the only way she can do that is by him becoming Jewish. And she tries really, really hard, and you know she manages to marry him, but then has issues later. But uh, isn't this a very real reason when we're living in, say, um, I mean, for want of a better word, to uh, when we're living in a secular society or a pluralistic society where we're living with other religions, it's people are bound to fall in love with someone uh, practicing another religion. So how do religions like uh, Zoroastrianism or Judaism plan to address that? Because um, if, you're live, if you're not going to get married to someone who is willing to embrace your religion, but your religion does not allow them to embrace it, how does one deal with that? Yeah. Well, I think here again we need to observe the changes in the way we think about, about marriage. Just as, just as we need to, to, to redefine the way we think about religion, we need to investigate how we think today about marriage because usually for many of us it's completely different than the way we thought about marriage 50, 100, definitely 200 years ago. To, because up to not long ago, at least in, in, in Western countries, and, and, and I think this is a process going on in India right now, how did we marry people? Basically, marriages were fixed, right? I mean, parents met, they, they thought it fitted in terms of uh, um, uh, religion and class and, and, and you know, economics and whatever, and, and the children were married, and if they liked each other, that was very nice, and if they didn't, that was not so bad. Anyway, the, 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 the goal was to produce children and heirs and whatever. Yeah. And, and today we think of marriage in a completely different way. We think of marriage as an emotional thing, as something that should satisfy me emotionally, that, I'm, that I should feel that I... And sexually. Of course, yes. And I, but, I, but, but, but you know, you can have sex without marriage. I don't know if... And marriage should be with someone that I'm in love with, he's the one or she's the one for me and we feel connection, or whatever, etc., 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 etc. So the whole definition of marriage, the, of this institute has changed. This is what allows for people of Jewish origin, I imagine of Zoroastrian origin, to meet others and to think of marrying them if they are not of the same religious group as legitimate. Because what counts is not my social 
circle, my, my place in the social matrix according to religion, class, and, and whatever. But what counts is what I feel. So the, the new modern state of the way we see marriage is what allows or really encourages people to marry outside of their religious denomination or, 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 or group when 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it would not have even crossed their minds. Now, your, your, but your question was, how do we deal with it? Well, okay, so as I said before, in the States, in, in the Jewish community in the United States, it's a big debate what exactly to do. Now, according to Jewish law, or traditional law at least, uh, a child born to a Jewish woman is Jewish, no matter who the father is, what religion the father is. So, for a lot of women, who American Jewish women who marry Christians, uh, usually, they see it less of, as a problem because the, the children will be Jewish and they will be still in the community. Men, on the other hand, have a greater problem. But the problem anyway is how, of course, to educate the children and to keep them interested in a religion that, as I said before, was not definitive enough as a element of identity for the mother or father to be uh, unwilling to marry out of it? That's the real question. When we come back to your next, I'd also like you to think of an expanded construct of marriage, not only in terms of like whether we marry people uh, to fulfill emotional needs or whether we marry people our parents choose for us. But for American Jews, I mean, even gay marriage is possible now. So how, how, do, how does Judaism deal with that? That's something to think about when we come back to you. But um, we haven't heard from you in a while, Ervat Karanja. So how do, how, does, how do Parsis deal with this? You know, someone falls in love with someone who's a non-Parsi and the anxiety about, you know, what will happen to the religion because there are such few Parsis in India and, you know, this person has decided to go and fall in love with a non-Parsi. So what are the anxieties around that? Um, basically, what we are talking about now are two different issues. One is whether the religion traditionally allows the practice of conversion or not. That is one issue that we have to deal with. The second issue is in the present contemporary times, what is happening and what are the needs of the present times. So considering the first aspect, as we have already discussed, um, Zoroastrianism, like Judaism, is an ethnic religion. It has always believed that uh, being into the religion comes not by default, but by birth, by um, heredity. That has always been an essential aspect of being a part of the Zoroastrian religion all throughout history. Now, in the present times and in the present moment, we all know that Zoroastrianism has been reduced to a very, very small global minority. Not just in India, but all over the world, the Zoroastrians today number 150,000. There are different estimates, plus or minus 20% here or there, but the general estimate is 150,000. Now, taking up your issue about marriage, that if a person falls in love with a person who is not of that religion, and if the religion does not permit conversion, then what to do? I think for two lovebirds who love each other for whatever reason, emotional, physical, psychological, social, financial, whatever reason, if they fall in love, then nothing stops them from getting married. Let me finish. Let me finish. You don't need to necessarily change your religion to get married. The law has given you Certain, uh, there's a special marriages act which allows you to marry without leaving the religion, the Indian constitution. So first of all, uh, it is not necessary to convert in order to marry. Conversion is a very, very fundamental issue, fundamental to the existence of the religion, especially Zoroastrian religion. Many people suggest that because you are so small, why don't you convert? so that you will grow big. But the simple thing is that we are so small and minuscule 
that it is first of all conversion is out of the religious this thing uh, there but even arguing that if it is there according to me it would be suicidal for a minority religion like zoroastrian religion to start conversion for uh, not only for practical reasons but for also political reasons so from a religious point of view it is out but from a practical point of view also it is out that conversion is not a solution it is not the medicine but it may count be a counteractive solution and wherever zoroastrians have gone after the downfall of the iranian empire we have historical records that zoroastrians have gone to other places apart from india where they have within a few generations um, got assimilated into the local people and the reason that we have sustained and survived as a community and religion in india for almost 1200 years is because we have maintained this few uh, fundamental teachings of what i call exclusivity and con non conversion as i said from a religious point of view you may call it a debatable issue because in the last 100 years of the history of the zoroastrian religion we see that there have been groups and people zoroastrian as well as non zoroastrian who have said that zoroastrian religion does enjoin conversion they do cite from uh, pesiko you want to say yeah, something but, uh, but i have to ask her what rania don't you think that that if that i mean that if no conversions will take place really the population of 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 the zoroastrians will continue to dwindle and 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 god forbid that the religion will will die out are you not afraid are you not concerned about that no so uh, see we have to learn from lessons of history we have to really learn from lessons of history we don't need to take a step which may endanger the existence of the community like if the zoroastrians follow the religious injunctions marry at a particular age at least have two children then there is no fear of extinction at all so rather than saying that yes go ahead and convert go ahead and do things in order to save the religion i would rather say go ahead and marry at a particular age because marriage in zoroastrian religion is a religious duty go ahead and procreate because procreation is also a religious duty so rather than giving an injunction which is anti religion i would say rather be in the religion and follow the religion and allow it to sustain and survive i i think your answer is a good example of what i talked about before that that what is important for you are saying for zoroastrianism is to survive even as a minuscule minority in global society but as a pure a uh, uh, authentic faith tradition and not as i would say uh, traditions like islam and christianity and buddhism would say they would say size matters yeah we want to we want to have as many of us as possible you don't think that way and and this is the point that 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 uh, that like exemplifies what i what i yeah, said thank you toma for uh, agreeing with me on that Uh, because uh, majority of the zoroastrians do admit and agree that what matters is the identity uh, i'm also i'm also wondering if this idea of uh, you know protecting and conserving is related to the history of persecution for both communities whether it's uh, for jewish people or for Zora zoroastrians is is that something you want to talk about is uh, do you feel that there's a relation yeah many people erroneously believe that zoroastrians don't enjoin conversion that zoroastrians don't allow people into their places of worship because of the history of persecution now persecution is something that binds the community and religion together today i think it's the same with judaism and the same with uh, zoroastrianism we have a history of persecution and in a way that has bound the community together uh it is very well known the arab persecution after which the zoroastrians had to flee persia and come to india about 1200 years ago but much before that and after that also persecution has taken place which we are not aware of the end of the achaemenian dynasty in the 3rd century bc came about with the 
Greek conquest of Persia. And thereafter, Persia was systematically Hellenized for more than a century. The Greeks systematically destroyed everything that gave birth to nationalism. And that included the religion, the history, the text, the culture. But even after that, it was so strongly inbuilt that like a phoenix, it rose up after more than a century. After that, the Arab conquest took place. The Arab persecution was there and we had to flee the homeland. After that, there were many other persecutions. Like all the Zoroastrians had not come to India. Only a very small number, perhaps say about three to 5,000 in the initial phase and thereafter in boatloads of 3,000, 5,000. But the majority was still there in Persia or Iran. But then there were other um, attacks by the Afghans, by the Mongols, by the Turks, which systematically decimated the Zoroastrian population in Iran till they were left to a few thousands. So yes, persecution is a very strong aspect in the Zoroastrian religion, but it would be wrong to feel and think and believe that it is because of this persecution, persecution that we are sticking to non-conversion. Yeah. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, Dr. Persico, um, the history of uh, persecution is quite important for Jewish identity as well. And, uh, you know, um, apart from, uh, uh, apart from talking about the family's legacy of um, you know, suffering during the Holocaust, even uh, when American Jews, for example, when they think about the Israel-Palestine relationship, the memory of the Holocaust is pretty central to that. So how would you uh, reflect but, on that? But first, I, I, will, I will really begin even before the Holocaust. I mean, uh, I have to I sympathize with what uh, what the Rania said. Um, Judaism has a very long history of persecution. We also suffered from the Greeks, from the Babylonians, for them, from the Romans, and 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 so persecution became really part of the Jewish identity, being persecuted, and in, it also has a relationship with conversion, or maybe with the the communal identity of Jews, because it is the the animosity the Jews experienced in diaspora, meaning in their settlements outside of Israel, and they were exiled from Israel more than one time, it is the animosity that they felt that bound them together. And there is a famous story about a great rabbi, a great um, a rabbi from Eastern Europe, that from, from Russia, that when Napoleon came uh, in the 19th century, and wanted and, and tried to conquer Russia and bring to it the enlightened values of the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, freedom for everybody, etc., etc. That rabbi prayed that the Russian czar, the, the Russian tyrannical czar, will vanquish Napoleon so that the Jews will not get freedom and individual rights, so they will stay Jewish. And, well, his prayers have, were answered. Napoleon was beaten in Russia. But his instincts were right, even if you don't agree with what he thought, his instincts were right. Because, as I said before, the problem, or, or, or there, uh, there's a, maybe we can call it a double-edged blessing in, in the United States. Other than India, Really, other than India, which Jews have, have been here for thousands of years, other than India, the United States is the only other uh, place where Jews have never been persecuted. It's very tolerant, as India, to the Jewish religion. And the problem with that, if it's a problem, is that the Jews feel free to, to uh, shed off themselves their separate ethnic identity. And... As I said before, that's a, a reason for concern for a, a lot of American Jews. And, um, though, um, you know, as you said, uh, America has been a place where, uh, you know, the Jewish, communi Jewish communities have found um, shelter. Um, 
how do you see this as a you know like the current political situation uh, and uh, the um, existence of jews in relation to that whether it's donald trump in the us or narendra modi in india because uh, though uh, the us is secular and so is india there is increasingly a wanting to link a citizenship to and a national pride to you know what uh, community what religion you belong to well, you know, as for India, I think that the actual number of Jews here has is is so small that I don't think it's it's really something to be concerned about. But but there is concern about the place of Jews in Trump's America, uh, and and there, I mean it's pretty obvious that uh, whether or not uh, Trump's advisors or some of them are anti-Semitic. A lot of anti-Semitic Americans are very happy with Trump. That's a fact. And I mean, just today I, 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 I woke up and, and looked at the Twitter and there was this, these pictures from the subway in New York. Uh, someone had um, painted swastikas in the subway. So I mean, that, I, I think that, and really the, 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 the thing with this is that this is something that would have not crossed the minds of American Jews even in their darkest dreams a year ago. This is something that, I mean, really American Jews have thought that they have left anti-Semitism for the books of history. And, and what is happening now is, is certainly unsettling. I mean, whether or not this will intensify, I really can't tell. I don't know, I don't, I, I, I actually, it's, it's hard for me to believe that Trump will go all the way to I don't think so, to persecution or something like that. But, but the very fact that, uh, that the atmosphere he creates, I think, is one of diversion, of diver I mean, of, um, uh, of distrust of strangers, of, self, of people who are different, uh, rise, raises up these voices that are always hidden in, in the dark corners of society. So while you're saying that anti-Semitic people in the U.S. have sort of gained strength in Trump's America, one also sees a huge number of Jews in America who are uh, who have a strong political stance against the Jew against the Israeli occupation in Palestine. So uh, how does one, you know, when you said that uh, ethnic identity and uh, spiritual life is so closely linked to uh, the way in which the Jewish, in which the Israeli state was formed and Israeli state being synonymous with Jewish state really. How do individuals like yourself, like various other uh, Jews living in America and in Israel reconcile, you know, what's in the scripture with what their political beliefs are? Well, well the scripture is, is, is another thing, but, but first of all, there's definitely a point of tension for American Jews between their ethnic identity and their liberal identity. And, and I want to stress this. Liberalism for American Jews is an, a deep part of their identity. That is why almost every NGO or liberal group in America has a lot more Jews in it than the percentage of Jews in uh, the relative percentage in society. American Jews, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them are very liberal, and, and yes, they, they, they feel the tension between their identity as ethnic Jews and what they perceive is the wrong that Israel, the state of Israel does with the occupation of the Palestinian people and, and, uh, and uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, some of it is being uh, translated into being further, being pushed further away from Israel for them. They want less to identify with what they perceive is wrong. So this is, by the way, a worry that, uh, that concerns uh, Israeli political uh, establishment. That they are, they may be, will be losing the support of American Jews. What do you think in terms of, uh, you know, um, minority issues, the fact that um, we now have a government, it, okay, uh, of course, it's not the only government that is divisive, but we now have a government that has people that explicitly say that they want to link um, citizenship 
and nationality to religion. So, uh, as someone who belongs to a minority community, how do you feel about that? Because when uh, Zoroastrians came to India, I mean, there was, um, I mean, the story of, you know, the sugar and the milk that we all know about. Uh, there was a, um, an invitation uh, to uh, mingle and to, you know, sort of be part uh, without really affecting how things are. And right now we are in a situation where um, though there are a huge number of refugees living in India, uh, there's a wanting to privilege Indian identity as Hindu identity and not an inclusive secular identity. I think at no point in the history of this nation has Zoroastrian religion or Zoroastrian minority or the Zoroastrian people been perceived as a threat to any other community. If you have ever seen the history of the last 1200 years, the Zoroastrians chose to come to India especially because of the close links between Persia and Iran through millennia. And they knew that this was a tolerant place. But they also knew that when a tolerant person gives you refuge, allows you to follow your own, you should be grateful to that person. You should always, um, you should never be ungrateful. And that is what the Zoroastrians have done whenever and wherever they have lived up till now. They have never claimed anything. In fact, so much so that they sometimes go out of their way in not claiming the minority status. They say that we don't require it. We want to be one with the others. So in spite of being micro-minority, they have never tried to take away the right or uh, the privilege of any other person. And in that re for that purpose and reason, Zoroastrians have never pursued as a threat. And I don't think any other people or person see them or perceive them as a threat. And that is why the Indian government has gone out of its way to change its policy of family planning for the Parsi Zoroastrians. So for the rest of the nation, the, fam uh, the policy of family planning is there that you should restrict your family to two children. But the government today is going out of its way in giving the Parsi Zoroastrians a grant and saying, go forth and multiply. <laughs> Get as many children as possible. So the government is going out of their way to look after us as a minority and we see to it that we don't do anything that might be a threat to whoever is in power. But, uh, sorry, um, the Zoroastrians have always risen to injustice. If you study the history of the freedom movement, you see that uh, the Zoroastrians were among the first freedom fighters. Dada Bhai Navroji was among the first freedom fighter, even being in the British Parliament. As a member of the British Parliament, he fought against the British. So it's not that they are so servile as to accept whatever is dished out. But as far as there is no injustice, as far as things are good, they go out of their way to be loyal subjects. What would you think about the situation of other minorities in India? I mean, you've explained your stance on Zoroastrianism very clearly, but what about the situation of, say, Christians and Muslims or Jains and Buddhists in India? What do you think about that? No, frankly, I would not like to comment about other religions and communities. Firstly, because I have not studied the issue to that extent, so it would not be right for me to comment on that. The, the last bit I wanted to ask you as well as um, Dr. Persico is, you mentioned that uh, procreation is considered as a religious duty uh, within Zoroastrianism. So how does one um, respond to women who don't want to have children or men who don't want to have children? Either because, well, they just don't want to have children or because they are gay or trans people who don't want to have children. How does uh, Zoroastrianism uh, have a conversation with these concerns? See, there are, question for you. there are many things in each and every religion which the religion wants us to do. But very frankly, we don't do it for our own convenience. This is one of the issues where we are specifically told that God is very happy if a person marries. Compared to an unmarried person, God is happier with a married person. And compared to a married person without progeny, 
or with few progeny, God is happier with a person who has got uh, more progeny. Now, it is whether you want to make God happy or not. So, it is... You your, make your, your spouse your... happy before that. Pardon? You make your spouse happy first. Uh, procreation and making your spouse happy, I can't figure it out. Thank you for clarifying. Well, okay, well, Orthodox Judaism, let, let, uh, maybe I should first say, um, Israel and Judaism in Israel is very much connected to Orthodox Judaism. It is a certain very traditional denomination of Judaism, uh, while, the, uh, while the Jews in the United States have other denominations who are uh, larger there than the Orthodox, the Reform, uh, denomination, the Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism. So far, where we're at right now is that Orthodox Judaism does not have a real uh, place for homosexuals or trans or uh, such. They are now beginning to be accepted in society, like they are not shunned, they are not you know, threatened or anything, they are accepted but they are perceived as doing the wrong thing, okay? While Reform and Conservative Judaism have, have, have changed the tradition, uh, 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 reinterpreted the tradition that allows and accepts fully uh, gay men and women. But I, uh, but I have to say that as far as the Israeli society is concerned, there is almost complete um, acceptance of homosexuality in modern Israeli society. So here there's a real divergence, the real point of tension between the state the society is in, certainly in the United States, but also in Israel, and the state that the tradition is in. The, and this is, uh, uh, and, uh, I mean, this is a point where, where Orthodox rabbis and traditional uh, uh, social leaders in Israel have a real problem because it's getting m much more difficult or more and more difficult for them to express their dislike yeah, or their forbiddens of homosexuality. Now, will the tradition change like reform and like conservative Judaism? Will, also, will Orthodox Judaism also finally reinterpret the tradition in order to allow for homosexuality? I don't know. I, 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 contrasted with other points of tradition which are easier to reinterpret, this is a problem. And, and for me, I, I, it's fascinating for me simply to see the way that this struggle is going on, where society and really everybody, almost everybody in Israel is totally past the, the point of acceptance for homosexuality, it's, sim it's, it's a majority, for the majority, it's simply obvious. And traditionals still have a great problem with that. And, and it's fascinating to see how they struggle with it. Uh, before we move into audience questions, right? Yeah, just one minute. So I want to thank you both for um, allowing me to play devil's advocate, for uh, allowing me to ask you all the difficult and challenging questions. So I acknowledge that respectfully. Um, before we move into audience questions, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, Dr. Persico has spent a lot of time in India, and he's also written about his explorations with, uh, with Vipassana, with uh, Krishnamurti, and with uh, various uh, traditions. Um, with the Ramana, Ashram in Tiruvannamalai, with Nisargadatta Maharaj. So that's also something you can ask him about. You don't need to ask him only about conversion. So yeah, uh, it's time for audience questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, this question is uh, addressed to Dr. Persico. You know, you, uh, an observation that you made that India is one country where there was no persecution of Jews and the Jews were allowed to live very well. I think that's a very valid observation and something we, uh, I fully endorse. But yet, Post-independence, there has been a large-scale migration of Jews, Indian Jews, out of India. As a result, sometime in, in the 1951 census, the population of Jews in India was 40,000 40, plus. It's dwindled to not even 5,000. I mean, would you, what is your take or would you care to comment on that situation? What is the reason? Well, 
Well, I, the reason is, is, is pretty obvious, and it's the founding of the State of Israel, and there has been a lot of effort by the State of Israel to, to uh, encourage uh, Jewish people all over the world to come and settle in Israel, being the national home of the Jewish people. Whether, uh, I mean, I, I, I really can't say, I mean, there is something to be, lo to be, to be said about the loss of divergent cultures and of a community that was thriving here in India really for, for almost 2,000 years and, and that has dwindled away. I mean, it's, it's, it's of course unfortunate. On the other hand, the, the, the individual people are happy with their move. So, uh, I mean, I guess I, I, I have to congratulate them for that. Hi. Um, so conversion actually as a subject in Judaism uh, evolved in terms of uh, how they viewed who was Jewish. Uh, in King David's time or in biblical time, Moses married a non-Jew. Uh, Ruth was a convert to Judaism as described at the end of the biblical text in the Jewish canon. Um, and uh, who is a Jew, the mother or the father on whose line the child is Jewish? itself sort of formalized more, let's say, in the, in the rabbinic times of where, when the Talmud was being drafted. Uh, that means the levers of religion in Judaism were existent in some way. They centered around the rabbinical Judaism that led to modern Judaism. Where do the levers lie in Zoroastrianism um, in, in saying that conversion could now be open uh, to those who really want to be Zoroastrian? And uh, do these exist and where do they lie? As I said, uh, if you look at the last hundred years history of the community, Parsi community in Mumbai, there have been small movements where some people, indigenous people, who had intermarried, they started showing references from the religious texts saying that the Zoroastrian religion does permit and enjoin conversion. That was a very small minority. Against that, the, main, the scholars of the mainstream religion, they debated on the references that were shown, saying that these are not references to conversion, but these are references to certain universal aspects of the religion. Like in a reference in the text where it is stated that may the Mazdeyasni Zartoshti religion be well known in the seven regions of the earth, the people who are for conversion, they consider this as a mandate for conversion. That why should the text say they let it be well known in the seven regions of the world? Only if it was meant for conversion would it say that. So by inference they were trying to show that the text was in favor of conversion. But the mainstream religious scholars and the head priest very convincingly thwarted these attempts. This has not happened once, but at least four or five times in the community's history in the last hundred years. There has also been this case where people generally say that Prophet Zarathustra must have also converted. Otherwise, where would he have got uh, the people from? But once we understand that there was no established religion prior to Prophet Zarathustra, you can just say that there were two belief systems prior to Zarathustra. One belief system was a monotheistic belief system called Mazda Yasni. Other belief system was a polytheistic belief system called Dev Yasni. And Zarathustra himself being born a Mazda Yasni, he just tried to forward this belief system and then it was uh, established as a Mazda Yasni Zarathustri religion. So, the question of Zarathustra converting anybody from any other established religion does not come at all. Please do this. I'd, I'd like to introduce myself as Mayor, a Zoroastrian, married to a non-Zoroastrian, Atul, who's sitting beside me. Um, the question is, and this stems from your question, uh, who is a Zoroastrian? Does the lever come from the father or the mother? And uh, when you spoke of uh, authenticity, and ethnicity being linked, uh, I would say that 
I am an authentic Zoroastrian. I am an ethnic Zoroastrian. My roots are Zoroastrian. But my son Varun is not a Zoroastrian. It is not biologically ordained through the mother. It is not divinely ordained because in a sense I was, I heard from uh, Ervad that I, I actually, you know, it's, it's the spiritual path in which you're grown. So it's either biological or it's spiritual. So between this contest between biology and spirit, I would wonder which is more morally correct. I would prefer that my son chose ethically and morally to be a Zoroastrian than what was biologically ordained. And on another point, I'd also like to say that the Zoroastrian religion permits fathers, Zoroastrian fathers, children to have their Navjot ceremonies, but not mothers. And this is very discriminatory. So I just like to end, I mean, on that point. My small point is about authenticity, ethnicity. Does it come from a spiritual context or from a biological context? Do you mind the, uh, listening to those two questions as well and then responding so that we have given everyone a fair chance? Could we listen to those two questions? Uh, these two guys were standing here. Hello. Uh, this is both for Judaism and uh, Zoroastrians. Uh, does the religion interfere in, uh, suppose, if you need a blood, blood group uh, as a medical sign, does it interfere? You need, uh, you need to... You need to have a, a, a Jew blood group to be given to a Jew? I didn't really get your question. Do you uh, mind phrasing that differently? <laughs> Means, uh, uh, is the religion, religion discriminates the blood issue also. Means you have a pure blood, right? Uh, means, means... Oh, I, I'll address it. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to hear the third question as well and then you can address it. Because I know we're getting into sensitive territory. My name is Anand, and my question is not so much on conversion, but on the persecution. Was persecution based on religion or economic grounds? Or, hey, that girl is beautiful, let's kill the guy and grab the girl, as simple as that. Or, what was the persecution in history, in both Zoroastrian and, and Judaism? Why? What is the reason was, for Was it economic, or was it uh, social, or was it purely religion? Ah, okay. we do the blood question first. No, um, there's a lot of misunderstanding and heartburn on this issue. It's a very sensitive issue, I understand. Now, generally, when we say that we do not convert, people generally think in between the lines and feel that we are saying we are superior. Please don't misunderstand that. Nobody is superior or inferior to other. We are just different. So it's not a matter that my blood is different from your blood. And to clarify your point, no. At least from the point of view of Zoroastrianism, there is no ban on any Zoroastrian accepting blood from any blood bank. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll answer you. No, I, I mean, uh, about persecution, very short. Uh, persecution was for, for two main reasons. Persecution by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by the Greeks, by the Romans was ba um, basically political. Uh, the Jews had an independent state, these empires conquered it, and the persecution was political. Persecution by Christianity and Christian countries, and later Islam, was religious. Because these empires had as their central identity a certain religion which Judaism was a problem for. Whether or, how do we decide what is authentic? I think your question is, is, is very telling and it connects to, to things we talked about. In the past, certainly I would say that the idea was that your ethnicity and your bloodline and your uh, adherence very specifically to a certain tradition is what makes your religion authentic. And today, what we what more and more people think is that whatever you have inside, your soul, your spiritual journey, your spiritual attainments or whatever, is the more authentic connection to the divine. So it really depends. It's, 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 
you know, two different views on the same question. She wants, she wants the Parsi view on this. Um, the lady pointed out that Zoroastrianism is discriminatory from the point of view that uh, children of men who are married to a non Zoroastrians, they are admitted and not the other way around. I would like to tell the lady that the religion is totally neutral on this issue. The religion is neither for men or women. This idea which has emerged comes from a, uh, judge a judgment which was given a century back. And in that judgment, one of the observation was that a Parsi Zoroastrian who marries a non Zoroastrian, the word they used in the judgment was alien. If they would have used that word now, people must have uh, got uh, many different ideas. But if a person has married an alien, and if their child is properly admitted into the religion, then according to the laws of the land, that child should get all the benefits of the father, including the religious benefits. So that is where this issue has come about. If you see anywhere in the religion, the religion is never discriminated. I got to know from gestures that we have two minutes. I want to quickly ask you something that uh, when I think of Israel uh, uh, and Jewish identity, I also think of Pakistan and Muslim identity. That's the other country that I know of, which was founded on the base of religion. And um, you know, you've talked in your work about how um, Israel was not only meant to be a safe place for all Jews around the world, but also an ideal society. And uh, you know, even Pakistan was founded on the same idea, not just a safe place for all Muslims of the world, but also a place that would show the world what a society should be like. Do you see any parallels? Well, I, what, what you mentioned here are parallels, but of course the, the differences between these two countries are so great that these parallels shrink um, in front of them. I mean, I mean, the fact is that Islam is the second largest religion in the world. It's, it's billions of people. And, and so there are many, many countries who are or who have a majority or a great majority of Islamic citizens. And there is only one state in the world who has a majority of Jewish citizens. So, of course, the situation is completely different. Uh, uh, what you said about the, the vision of an ideal society, that's true. And, and uh, I think uh, it's one of the strengths of Zionism that pictured the state of Israel not only as a safe haven from, for, from persecutions, but as something that is supposed to be a model, a, a, a moral model, an ideal society. And, and I think this is one of the things that for me gives hope that indeed we will continue to improve and, 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 and try all the time to reach that goal. Thank you both for talking so candidly about your faiths.